Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to FSU Coach Live. My name is Tim Baggerst, and today's guest is Nick DeForest. Nick, thanks for joining me. Uh, a man of many talents, athletic director, and then you're part of this thing called Globe Trotting ADs. I want to learn about that in a little while, but if you wouldn't mind, just share your story and how you got to where you are today. Sure, sure, Tim. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's It's been a journey. I'm Right now, I'm in Vienna, Austria, uh, in my basement. I started in uh, St. Catharines, Ontario, just north of the border, and uh, played baseball growing up, played some juco ball in Buffalo. And before going to Niagara University, I got asked by an old coach, do I want to go to Austria for a year? and playing coach baseball. And that one year is now getting on 23. Wow. Um, not, not playing. I hung those those cleats up a while ago. Um, but just uh, moving internationally was just amazing. And I didn't want to to ever go back. Um, so I, I coached and I played with a club team here, the Austrian national team as well. Um, not played, just coached. Um, and then I got into the school. Uh, I found this private international school here in Vienna. And they had a baseball team, so I started coaching the baseball team. And then I found out about this job, athletic director. I, being Canadian, we don't have those at our high schools and didn't really know um, what it was all about. But I uh, fell in love with it, started to work at the school. Um, great boss, involved me more and more and more. And I've been, um, I think, 18 years at the school now, uh, just over 10 years full time. And uh yeah, that's that's where I am. That's how I got here. What is what does that look like working at an international school in what we would call a foreign country? Obviously, not foreign to you anymore. How does how does that work? Who do you play? What's the language spoken, et cetera? Yeah, it's um, well, there could be, I think, 100 different answers to that, depending on the city and the country you're in. Um, but what what like links them all is English. So the, the curriculum is taught in English. Um, for a lot of people, it's like a home away from home. You know, a lot of Americans are overseas working in embassies, uh, bases, for, uh, companies. Um, so we have about 20% Americans at our school. And uh, we're called the American International School, Vienna. So we, we're linked to the uh, US uh, curriculum. So our kids can get a US high school uh, degree. But there's a ton of variations around the world. So there's British international schools. There's just an international school, um, which maybe isn't linked to American or British, but just a, a general curriculum. Um, and we all have the IB program, which I know many schools in the US have now. So that links all of us together with what we what we teach. And, and then who we play, really, it, uh, it all depends, like I said, about the area, even of the world. So we're fortunate in Central Europe there are a lot of international schools, at least in the capital cities, and we can travel uh, very easily. So we play in, in Munich and in Frankfurt and up to London, uh, Paris, all over um, for end of season tournaments. It'd be pretty rare for an international school to have a league, but you're involved in conferences. And then everyone in that conference always goes to the end of season tournament. So there's no, you know, uh, having to win this game to then next week play in this city or that city simply because travel uh, is too hard to organize. So my daughters are both in middle school. We'll fly to Zurich next week for a um, end of season tournament and they'll play seven other international schools. Okay. And then in tournament, in season, mm -hmm. who are you playing? Are you playing local schools? Yeah. Yeah. We're very fortunate in Vienna. We have three other international schools. Um, oh. One of them our size. We're, we're about 800. The other big school is just over a thousand. And then there's two others, about 500. So we get to play them, but just let's say weekday games. So friendlies, um, of course, we're keeping score and we have officials and take it seriously, but not not to count to any any league or anything. Uh, and then we'll, most schools will have an exchange with another school. So Budapest is three hours away. Um, those same daughters this Saturday will drive to Budapest for uh, a day's games. And that happens pretty much around the world, depending on, on what, um, what country you're in or how many games you get. I think, I think about 10 games before the tournament is a good season for almost every team, no matter where you are. And what kind of, what kind of sports, and I say this, I guess, delicately, what kind of level are these players? Because you don't have a massive school district to pull talented players to. You're not playing regularly. 
like you would maybe in a, a school system in the U.S. What kind of talent do you have? What kind of sports do you offer? Right. Yeah, the talent is is pretty low uh, generally. Of course, there's some great athletes um, out there, you know, gems uh, that that go off and play pro. But that's really really rare, and the programs are aren't geared towards them at all. That's one great great difference for me is we don't have to worry about kids trying to get scholarships mm. and go play at the next level. Like I said, some do, um, but it's about competing and having fun and learning the game uh, for the most part. I'm not to say that the level isn't isn't good, but it's definitely, I don't know, a JV, a good, the, our best teams would be a good JV, JV level. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting the where you go. I think, as I said, I'm in Central Europe and that's pretty similar throughout. But as you get into Asia, there's some really big schools, a couple thousand uh, kids. And there it's a lot tougher to make varsity teams like it would be in Florida, um, where in, in Vienna, uh, you know, both my daughters hadn't played soccer before and they're on the middle school soccer team, you know, and um, they'll probably play basketball in a few weeks and then softball uh, comes spring. So to your question about the sports, it's basically the standard team sports um, that everybody knows, I think everybody, um, but are also taught in our in our PE programs. So right now we have cross country and tennis and soccer and volleyball, basketball, swimming in the winter, um, track and field, softball. Uh, in the spring and you know we have baseball I mentioned as being a baseball coach but that's pretty rare around the world I mean it goes where you are in the pockets that you have so we don't have rugby but the other school in Vienna has rugby for example um, and then as you get into Asia there'll be badminton teams and sorts of different of those varieties that are more popular in those areas you're you've been an athletic director for for a number of years now and the story is interesting, right? Because you came in with essentially very little preparation and training for, for the role that you have. Right. What have you learned along the way that you think is going to be important wherever you're an athletic director, whatever level you're doing it? Yeah, um, it, it was a lot of learning learning by doing and, and having some great mentors. So I would say you know, find someone you can talk to and communicate with about the job. Get a, if it's someone as close, it could be a mentor that you could call or just some close colleagues. Um, but I think it boils down to communication, whether it's with that mentor or person or with the parents that, uh, of the athletes you have, other teachers in your school, coaches, uh, really learn how important communication is, um, you know, timely, accurate, all, all those things. Uh, it affects every little thing that we're that we're, we're doing. Now talk a little bit too about your coaches. Um, how, how are they trained? Where do you find them? Yeah. Um, what, how do they, how are they compensated? How is it different to, to us systems? Yeah. Uh, I think a big one is, and I know it's not the same in every state and every sport, but uh, a big thing is the, the compensation. So you it's not a living wage, you know, that everyone's either a teacher at the school or basically a close community member, maybe some some local people that live by the school or are connected in some way uh, because you're not doing it for the money. Um, we pay a stipend of 1,500 euros roughly for a, a head coach, but that's three months. It's not too long of a season, but that's pretty much just a thank you. And that's... Um, Basically, in international schools around the world, that's that's the norm. I mean, obviously, the salary goes up and down a little bit, but it's um, it's just a, a nice thank you for for working with the kids and, and doing something that you love. Um, so that's the compensation where you find the coaches. We're lucky we have about 80 percent of our teachers that coach. Uh, but that other school down the road from us uh, probably has about five percent of their teachers coaching. So wow. also. It varies of how you know important athletics is in the school and how much support you get. Um, you know, we really try to make our, our coaches feel valuable um, and and want to come back. You know, that retaining once we find a good coach, we definitely want to keep them. So uh, it's not easy. Obviously, everyone's got a different personality, but that's something that's important to us is trying to um, not do everything for them, but find ways to make their job easier. Uh, make them have more fun when they're out there coaching and want to do it longer. Uh, yeah. Where do, you, where do you find them then to, to that extent? Because if you're just relying on the teachers in the school, 
Yeah. Well, let's hope we get a let's hope we get a teacher who can coach tennis yeah. because we need we have a tennis spot open. How do you how do you actually? Is it is it just a warm body, so to speak, as many schools in the U.S. are are seemingly going? Uh, where do you get your qualified coaches to do a good job rather than just oversee athletics? Sure. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. And, and you asked about the qualification before, and I didn't answer, but I want to I want to answer that too. Um, we do have to settle for some warm bodies um, sometimes. Um, but I think those, those warm bodies would be teachers at our school. So at least they have that teaching, um, mm-hmm. that educational athletic kind of background. Maybe they're not an expert in, um, you know, basketball or tennis, uh, but they're there for the right reasons for the kids. So then we can, we can work with them. Thankfully, I haven't had to do that as a complete coaching staff. It's more like the assistant coach maybe is, is really inexperienced. Um, but I, I watched the interview with, with Zach and he mentioned that moving to a new school, not knowing the community around him, and it was find it hard to find coaches. Um, that's one thing really, uh, well, not really easy, but a lot easier for us. You know, I've been at the same school for a long time and you get to know the people around and you can reach out to some, some, you know, the referees that ref our basketball games. Hey, do you know anyone that wants to coach? I have this spot open. You get, you develop those relationships. And I think with those outside coaches that we have, and trying to retain them. Um, we've, we've been really lucky. We have had a volleyball coach over 20 years at our school, soccer coach over 20 years, and they're also bringing people. Hey, you know, they, they know how cool it is to work at our school and how nice it is. Um, so they're bringing people. Hey, I know somebody. Hey, I know somebody. So um, I would find that hard for people that move around to do that. And I find pretty lucky where we are. Um, but the, the qualification part, we, my school was the first uh, school to get the NFHS honor roll status um, outside of the U.S. And it's something I've been working at for a while because international schools pride themselves on having top value education for their kids in the classroom. You know, whether it's everyone has a MacBook and these great screens and tech and teachers with great experience and all over and from all over the world. But many of the schools don't really care about their coaches. They'll settle for the warm bodies, right? And I, I thought that was wrong from the, from the beginning. Um, I understand it's hard, but I saw the, that honor roll program with NFHS as a, as a good starting point to at least get some qualifications. Um, you know, a lot of them are in, in safety, child protection things, but also the fundamentals of coaching. So we make every coach do it now. It's um, been a few years and uh, everyone's on board. It's great. And then a lot of other coaches do more. You know, the inexperienced soccer coach that I just hired as a varsity assistant, um, I got him the soccer uh, course right away and he took that. So we we do our best, I think, to try to bring it up because if we want to market ourselves as as being this top place for students to, to get to the next level in life, athletics is a huge part of that. And our coaches should be a huge part of that as well. Agreed, agreed. That's great to hear. A, a question came through on YouTube from, from Connor. He says, what are some of the challenges you face at an international school that might translate to U.S. athletic programs? And how do you deal with cultural differences, both in athletes and parents? Wow. A couple, a couple part of there. Um, that's great, though. Uh, thanks, Connor. Some of the challenges. Um, I think a lot of parents... I think aligning the sales is a phrase I like to use with parents. And uh, if we want the program to run, uh, or, you know, go in the in the direction we want it to go to, we all need to be aligned. And that's the parents, to the students, to the coaches, to the the AD, and then the administration at the school. So I think that translate internationally and and uh, at home in the U.S. Uh, maybe different problems. We have a lot of um, I don't want to say absentee parents that they don't care about their kids, but Maybe they're not around because they're busy with work and they're traveling. traveling parents. Yeah, traveling parents. So, you know, different different problems with the parents, um, uh, but the same same reason to align them that we we all need to be on the same page. Um, and I just would you put the second part up for me, Tip? Sorry, just a bit too fat. Cultural differences. Yeah, um, that is great. So I mentioned we're twenty percent uh, American at our school. We're about 20% Austrian. And then the other 60% were from all over the world. 
Um, we have pockets of Koreans, um, some Ukrainian kids, and, and all over, a few Canadians as well. And they all come from different sporting backgrounds, not just cultural backgrounds, but the way sport is treated. So um, a lot of education up front, we try to have online coaches, uh, parent meetings, a lot of info on the website, just to really explain what we're all about. Uh, we find a lot of the international parents come from the club perspective. They don't know what sports are like at school. Um, they know, you know, the all round soccer club and they don't understand why after middle of November, the soccer program stop and we're starting to play basketball. They want to play more soccer. Um, and then from, you know, maybe the U S uh, side they're they're actually more happy to play more things. Um, but want, wonder why the level's so low, you know, for some of the things. So uh, a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, questions and answers, because it's really not a, um, a thing you can just do with one thing, because you're coming from so many different cultural backgrounds and areas. There are a lot of individualized um, questions or concerns. Um, but yeah, you that's the communication I mentioned earlier. The, the more info we have out there, try to fill the website. What is educational athletics? What is a competitive program? Um, all these things to have it out there to drive them to it. Uh, and just, you know, be ready, be open, realize that everyone's not coming from the same perspective as you. And I think we've settled in, uh, at least at my school, we settled in before COVID to like, this is what we always do. We, we've always done it and it's been easy. But now after a few years of not having the travel or the competitiveness that we've had before, we're realizing that everyone needs to be re-educated. You know, we haven't had people travel, um, you know, sixth and eighth grade daughter that I had haven't been on a team before last year. So the cultural differences are and how we deal with them uh, just been magnified after COVID. But yeah, thanks. Connor. Talk a little bit about this, this globe trotting, I, I trotting nice, just hard to come out of my, my <laughs> mouth trotting. Um, yeah. uh, but this ADs, what is it? What, what are you doing with it? Yeah. Um, so being so long at one school, which is very rare internationally, a lot of people move after three, four years. Um, I started to get to know the other schools, especially in our conference. And to, you know, want to do more, want to educate myself, wanted to make our school a better place. I started to connect with all these other ADs around Europe. And then I got into the NIAAA. Um, there's a big international group with a couple of good friends of mine and they showed me how important it was. I took some courses, um, did some more. I have my CMAA now, but then I started to go to the conference, the NIAAA conference. And that's where I met other international school ADs, but from outside of Europe. And in Europe, we're all very similar. Um, but then when you go out South America into the Asians, um, the, there's a lot of similarities as well, but then so many differences. It was really interesting to me and how, you know, a small school, let's say in Mongolia may have no one really around them, uh, but they may be really similar to a school in Southern France. So that's, that's two random examples, but there was no connection outside of these conferences. So I realized we need a, a place to connect, to talk about international schools in general, because as, as you know, you know, teachers can go down to the staff room and all sit and have lunch and talk about similar things about their school. But for the ADs, there's usually one in a school. And in an international school, there may be only one in the whole country. So, yeah, we saw it as a way of connecting people. And as soon as we started with the podcast, that was before COVID started. Um, we saw how kind of hungry people were to connect and emails started coming. And then COVID hit. And this community around the world was starting to grow and they kind of looked to us. So we started some uh, online conferences to connect even more. And then this um, international community of athletic directors and coaches started to grow and grow. And uh, it's been, it's been fantastic. It's been a bit of a ride. And if somebody wants to, to learn more about that, how do they, how do they find out? Is there a website, something? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Globe Trotten, there's no G, Glo Globe Trotten ADs.com. Um, and there's things on there. There's the, the podcast link. Uh, we just recorded our 70th episode uh, a few weeks ago. Um, there's a resource uh, tab. And 
that was that's really a place where yeah 80s from around the world can can put resources like our handbooks and things like that and, and we can all share and learn from each other so i want it to be a really uh, a community place not just the website but just globetrot and 80s in general uh, it's not just nick's not just the globetrot and 80s but i kind of think that all of us around the world are and that goes to a lot of my my friends in the U.S. that are ADs do a lot of uh, connecting and, and collaborating with, with people all over the U.S. too. I'm looking forward to going to the next NIAAA conference uh, in a month, just a little over a month. Orlando, right? Yeah. Um, no, it's um, um, it's in uh, Nashville. Excuse me. Year after is Orlando. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So this this podcast, this YouTube uh, channel. Yeah. Is, is really focused on on coaches and clearly athletic directors have strong connections with coaches for obvious reasons which is why we have people like you on the show because why not talk to their bosses as well as the the coaches themselves and so i usually kind of end the the show with just asking what advice you have for coaches given your experiences internationally but also working with coaches across different sports what 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 would you offer as advice for for those looking to become coaches who are maybe looking to improve as coaches? Yeah, well, I, I'd start with saying I think that coaches are a school and a school's most valuable resource. Um, you know, an AD touches all the all the the teams and all the sports, but the coaches are the ones really doing the work with the kids. So I try to to keep that in mind all the time that they're so important. We need to put a lot of resources in there, but they're, they're also in a high school, you know, they're one part of the puzzle, right? And those same kids that are um, playing soccer right now in the fall are going to play basketball, maybe not all um, in the spring. And they may have a few different coaches. So I want I see our coaching staff as one huge coaching staff and that not one team is more valuable than the other. And I would like, not that this is in, in a negative way at all, but I, I'd love all coaches to realize that, that they're one piece of the puzzle in the in the bigger picture. Um, and that, you know, the football team's not more important than the tennis team. And we're all touching lives uh, of the kids that we're coaching. And uh, we're all on the same team and they can help each other, you know. Um, football players come out and watch basketball basketball games and vice versa. So. I hope that didn't sound negative because I, I really want to stress how important it is, but that's, it's, they're one piece in the, you know, in the big puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody does have a question for you, wants to know more about um, Globetrot and ADs, wants to know a little bit more about AIS and, and what you do there, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah. Um, I think the easiest direct uh, there's Twitter is fast. Um, there it is right there, Nick underscore that. That's my short form, so you don't have to say the end, G-T-A-D-S. Um, but on the website that you've shown already, globetrotandads.com is, is my email and, and other ways to contact me. Um, I'm just, and I would be happy to, to uh, connect with anybody around the world. Um, I think that's what it's all about. And through the, the podcast, and it will enter some conferences. I've done some online live panel shows like this as well. And I've just written a book. Um, all, all with the hope of, of connecting and uh, improving the the lives of the students that we that we deal with on a day to day basis. That's great. And for those listening to the podcast, that's at Nick N I C K underscore G T A D S is where you can find Nick. Um, well, Nick, thank you so much for joining me and sharing a little bit about your your world of work. And yeah. uh, I, I know I I gained a little bit of insight myself and want to remind each and every one of you watching or listening that we try to put these out once every couple of weeks. So be sure to like and subscribe wherever you're watching or listening from. But on behalf of myself, Tim Baggers and Nick DeForest, thanks so much for watching. Thank you.